Okay, uh, Bishop Lopes, we will uh, we'll take it away. Okay. Very good. Good evening and welcome back to the first annual Truth in Tradition Summer Lecture Series sponsored by the Graduate Program in, of Theology at the University of St. Thomas in Houston. My name is John Kerwin and I'm an Assistant Professor of Theology and the Director of the Graduate Theology Program here at UST. Tonight is the fifth talk in the series and before I introduce tonight's esteemed guests, let me just take a moment to thank all of you who have been tuning in, uh, who have helped make this such a, a successful series so far. Our, all of our talks immediately go up uh, to our YouTube channel and our Facebook page. And up to this point, we've had over 7,000 views. In addition, I've received numerous messages and emails, DMs on Facebook, thanking our speakers for their e excellent talks, as well as the numerous inquiries about the series, as well as uh, about our theology program. So in light of these, these inquiries, let me just start off by answering this question. Uh, why tradition, why truth and tradition? Well, simply put, because this is what the theology department at UST is most passionate about, leading students deep into tr tradition. And it's really our belief that when students are exposed to the writings of the church doctors, the fathers, the councils and creeds, and the great theologians, and their reflection on scripture, tradition, and the magisterium, their faith is truly deepened and they become more effective instruments at the service of the church. John Paul II called us to defend the truth and he pointed us towards tradition itself as the way to do this in Fides et Ratio. So first we must recover the great conversation between faith and reason. So if this sounds appealing, then let me invite you to explore our MA in theology, which, is, which we feel is really the program for our times. It's online as, as well as in person with live or evening classes. And so you'll be led by the great scholar, by great scholars through Augustine City of God, Gregory of Nazianzus's five orations on the persons of the Trinity, Boethius's on the consolation of philosophy, Thomas's Summa, Bonaventure's Journey of the Mind to God, Hugh of St. Uh, St. Victor, the writings of John Henry Newman, and on and on and on. Also, we just started an education track where we prepare future Catholic school theology teachers by taking them deep into the tradition of Catholic education, where they can explore questions such as, you know, what is authority in education? What do the liberal arts mean today? How do we integrate science and education? Why does there seem to be so much antagonism between, between some modern understandings of education and science and the church's educational tradition? And of course, the answer to these things, we, we, we approach by going deep into the, into the tradition. The church fathers, the medieval theologians, the modern figures like C.S. Lewis, Christopher Dawson. Uh, we began our first theology of education class by taking students through uh, Sir Talange's on the intellectual life. They were, you know, it was, it was a kind of a transformational moment for many of them. And so all the information about this program can be found at, on our website at UST, uh, no, excuse me, realtheologyust.com, or you can shoot me an email on there and, or give me a call and I'll be happy to talk. Well, tonight I'm particularly delighted to welcome His Excellency Stephen J. Lopes. Bishop Lopes is the first bishop of the Ordinariate of the Chair of St. Peter and pastor to all its members and clergy in the United States and Canada. Uh, Stephen uh, Bishop Lopes was born in 1975 in Fremont, California to Barbara Jane and the late Dr. Jose de Oliveira Lopes. His father was Portuguese and his mother is Polish. Jose immigrated to the U.S. in the early 1960s and became an American citizen in 1970. Barbara Jane was born and raised in Detroit, where much of her family still resides. The only child to two educators, his father taught languages and history at the university level, and his mother taught at Catholic school for 47 years. Bishop Lopes was formed and educated by Catholic schools in the Golden State, St. Pius School in Redwood City, St. Edward School in Newark, and Moreau Catholic High School in Hayward. In high school, he began to discern the possibility of a vocation to the priesthood. He continued his discerning, his discernment during his studies at St. Ignatius Institute at the University of San Francisco, where he majored in theology and minored in philosophy and German. With the encouragement of his family, he entered St. Patrick Seminary in Menlo Park, California for one year, then completed his seminary education at the Pontifical North American College in Rome. He studied philosophy and liturgy at the University of Innsbruck and then earned three degrees, including a doctorate in sacred theology from the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. 
where he also served as an adjunct faculty member. On June 23rd, 2001, he was ordained to the priesthood for the Archdiocese of San Francisco by Cardinal William J. Leveda, then Archbishop Leveda. As a priest of the Archdiocese, he served as an associate pastor at two parishes, St. Patrick Catholic Church in San Francisco and St. Anselm Catholic Church in Ross, California. In 2005, he was named an official of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, the Vatican, of the, the Vatican office responsible for promoting and preserving Catholic teaching. For seven of his 10 plus years at the Vatican, he served as secretary to the Cardinal Prefect. He was named a Monsignor in 2010. Pope Francis named him the Bishop of the Ordinariate of the Chair of St. Peter on November 24th, 2015. He succeeded Monsignor Jeffrey Steenson as leader of the Ordinariate on February 2nd, 2016. For his motto, Bishop Lopes selected the Latin phrase magna opera, opera domini, or in English, great are the works of the Lord. By these works, the new bishop expresses his awe of God's grace in drawing his people to the fullness of Eucharistic communion. Bishop Lopes is a chaplain to the Order of Malta and remains deeply committed to the order's service to the sick and the poor. As a bishop, he is a full member of the United States Com Conference of Catholic Bishops and the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops. Bishop Lopes, it, it's a great honor to have you here. Welcome. And we usually, uh, I'll usually open in prayer, but I think it would be more appropriate for you to do so. So we're greatly looking forward to your talk on the Eucharistic doctrine of John Paul II. And please, you can have the floor and uh, open us in prayer. And, and uh, also, if, for those of you who would like to ask the bishop a question, we'll have a Q&A afterwards. And you can put your, if you're on Zoom, you can put your questions in the chat box or on the Facebook thread under the video, or on the YouTube thread. We'll get them all there and try to get them all in as the bishop has time. Thank you very Great. much. Bishop. Thank you. Let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Direct us, O Lord, in all our doings with thy most gracious favor, and further us with thy continual help, that in all of our works begun, continued, and ended in thee, we may glorify thy holy name, and finally, by thy mercy, obtain life everlasting. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. This evening, the presentation I'd like to give is on the Eucharistic doctrine of John Paul II um, as kind of a snapshot of, if you will, how tradition works, how the great theological tradition of the church works. And I use that word, works, uh, because it was a phrase that we would use often enough uh, at the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith because doctrine does not happen in a vacuum. And therefore, too, the church's tradition, um, rich as it is, unfolds in a context of time and space and, and the pastoral needs and demands of the, um, of the people of God. And really kind of tracing the Eucharistic doctrine of John Paul II uh, gives, a, I think, a really fresh and a fine example of, of, of the church's faith, which is ever ancient and ever new, interacting with uh, the needs of the moment. Um, and the moment is important in, in, this kind of, uh, in this kind of endeavor. There are figures of the church's history, the great theologians, uh, the doctors of the church. Um, and you know, personally, I would consider John Paul II certainly to be of their number, uh, who, uh, who come in at a crucial moment. And the moment itself uh, contributes to the resounding influence that that figure can have uh, on shaping the theological tradition and the doctrinal formulations of, of the church. And John Paul II's 26 year period as Pope, those particular years um, are one such moment. And I think it's important whenever you're talking about the theology of St. John Paul II to remember the moment because it was an enormous period of social, political and economic upheaval. Uh, the sexual revolution, it was 10 years old at, that, at the point where he becomes Pope. You have the rise and the fall of the totalitarian state. Uh, you know, it's not for nothing that even at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library, you have a whole section there on the fall of communism and John Paul II and Ronald Reagan's relationship during that period uh, is even there in that secular sense, uh, kind of bracketed out as something noteworthy. He comes to the scene in the immediate aftermath of the Second Vatican Council, 1978. So the council is, is, is basically just over 10 years old and still resonating in the life of the church. 
the official pro official promulgation of the liturgy and the vernacular is less than five years old at his election. And so all the way that 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 the mass was changing um, in, in that same period, 1965 to 1978, um, for those who are old enough to remember the, the the crisis of those years after the council, I use the word crisis because 30% of priests left the priesthood just in those years. And the numbers among women religious and men religious were even higher. So, I mean, the entire life of the church seems to be in upheaval. And what does he do? He comes out on the balcony in October of 1978 and points us immediately to the Jubilee year of 2000. His entire spiritual and pastoral focus, the entire focus of his theological endeavor was to bring the church to that moment, that moment of renewal. And that is the way that he understood the, the, the movement of the Second Vatican Council to find its maturity, to find its mature expression in the life of the church by focusing us on the Lord Jesus. And therefore, the, the, the 2000th anniversary, the Jubilee uh, of the Incarnation as the whole theological project. What did he come to do? To bring us into the Jubilee and into the third Christian millennium. That's how he understood himself. He understood that because he described the nature of the Jubilee itself as Eucharistic and Trinitarian. To give thanks to the triune God from whom everything proceeds in the world and in history, and to whom all things eventually return. That's a direct quote from his Bull of Indiction of the Jubilee year. Therefore, the profound ecclesial reflection on the core of faith, the Paschal mystery of Christ, as it is celebrated in the Eucharist, becomes, if you will, the program of the Jubilee year. You remember those, there were 19... Uh, 97, 98, 99, the three years of preparation, the year of God the Father, the year of God the Son, the year of God the Holy Spirit, reflecting on the core of the Trinitarian faith as it is celebrated in the church's liturgical and um, sacramental life. He, in 26 years, was a prolific author, of course, and in the great corpus of papal teaching, I'm going to propose that the doctrine of the Eucharist is perhaps uniquely positioned to give insight both into John Paul II's theological project and the pastoral program, uh, which is the context for its expression. Now that already says something. Be, bear with me a moment because the corpus is huge. And so you can pick out all sorts of things and say, aha, well, this is the hermeneutical key to John Paul II. Theology of the body is uh, an example that comes uh, right to the fore, but also Christian anthropology. Uh, the nature of the moral act, you know, I mean, one of the most lasting and enduring contributions he makes uh, is the encyclical Veritatis Splendor, uh, and his entire focus, almost passionate focus on the new evangelization. By contrast to some of these big overarching themes, you know, his theology of the Eucharist, well, it doesn't seem as uh, glamorous, but it bookends the entire thing so very nicely. Because there are two places where his Eucharistic doctrine is uh, most clearly articulated. And they find themselves right at the beginning and right at the end of his pontificate. The 1980 apostolic letter, Dominici Cene, and the 2003 encyclical letter, Ecclesia de Eucharistia. There are, of course, homilies and Wednesday catechesis and all those kinds of things, but in the gambit of papal teaching, there is nothing formal on the Eucharist between 1980 and 2003. And that's rather significant. So it's a very interesting, and I would say theologically rich exercise to take these two documents, Domenice Cene and Ecclesia de Eucharistia, and compare them side by side. They are unified, of course, in terms of their topic, but they are very different documents in terms of tone, aims, pastoral concerns, there, this is not a, um, a development of doctrine, per se. I mean, John Paul II's doctrine of the Eucharist does not change, and it doesn't develop into that. But what you do see is a very marked development in the expression and application of church teaching to a very specific ecclesial and pastoral moment. This is the tradition resounding in a context. 
And the context, again, is important. John Paul II isn't trying to give some sort of academic lecture in these texts because he is a pastor in the fullest sense. And so as a pastor, as a rather theologically astute pastor, he brings the length and the breadth of the church's theological tradition and doctrinal tradition to bear in the unique moment in which the people of God find themselves. I propose, therefore, that these two documents on the Eucharist are a theological diptych, contemplating and interpreting each other, and therefore leading into a deeper immersion into the tradition and into the central mystery of the church's faith. So what I'd like to do this evening is just give a brief overview of these two parts, these two halves of his doctrinal teaching to see how it plays out and how it speaks to the moment. The apostolic letter Dominice Cene is, has the subtitle, The Mystery and Worship of the Holy Eucharist. As I said, it comes out in 1980, specifically on Holy Thursday, 1980. He would write a letter to bishops and priests every year on Holy Thursday, although this one in 1980 is the only one that bears the theological mark or note of apostolic letter. The others are more uh, just kind of, uh, if you will, reflections on the Eucharist. But this is, this is therefore intended in its promulgation as a teaching document. I don't know how many of you remember liturgy between 1975 and 1985, but... Um, it was wild, uh, to say the least. Uh, it was a time of great liturgical upheaval. Uh, and as I mentioned, so many people, so many priests leaving ordained ministry. There was a time of great experimentaliz uh, experimentalization. Um, in the early 1980s, it was rather normal and routine, I thought, as a kid, to, to have a slideshow during Mass and all these other kinds of things. Um, and that is the moment in the immediate aftermath of the council that he steps into in, in articulating Eucharistic faith. So he desires to give a personal witness as Pope to the Eucharist, the core of, uh, of that theological doctrine that shaped his own life as a man and as a priest. And so for therefore, uh, as you read the, the, the text, the key that unlocks it all is first faith. Faith that the Eucharist is not something just to be believed, but the believing of it leads to an, to an encounter with the Lord, and that has, therefore, implications on life. Faith is the personal presence of the risen Lord uh, in the Eucharistic sacrifice, and encountering that presence leads to reverence, reverence specifically before the mystery of the cross. Faith leads to reverence before the mystery of the cross. The Pope understood that for most people, the vast majority of the Catholic faithful, Mass is the primary frame of reference for their spiritual life and for their interaction with the church. Where do Catholics interact with the church? At Sunday Mass. You know, there's the Pope, and yeah, they might be, you know, generically aware that there's, you know, a bishop somewhere that sort of looks over them, but their reality is the parish where they go on Sunday for the Eucharist. And so now, with all of this kind of upheaval and new language and, you know, uh, change things changing seemingly on a Sunday to Sunday basis, the Pope understood that the faithful were at this point feeling rather disoriented, disaffected, even somewhat confused. And that becomes the overarching pastoral concern uh, that he seeks to address in this document. And so therefore, the Eucharistic doctrine of Dominice Cene unfolds almost exclusively along Christological lines and almost exclusively along the lines that would be familiar to, if you will, an older generation, because it essentially follows the doctrinal content of the Council of Trent. So let's, let's trace that a little bit to see what I mean. Um, the focus will be therefore on the same kind of, the, the, the same laser focus that Trent had on the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, the representation of that sacrifice in the mass, and therefore the constitution of the church as arising out of that. So the self-offering of Jesus on the cross. Dominica Cene would repeat the ancient doctrine 
that the cross is the full realization of charity and the full response of love of which the Eucharist is its sign. Love, the most authentic characteristic of the Christian vocation, is ultimately understood here, the love of Christ on the cross. That is what love is. Every other example, every other expression of love ultimately leads back to this, the love of Christ on the cross. It is where love itself gets its power and gets its dynamism and gets its authenticity. So sacrifice, sacrificial love, freely embraced love, has a propitiatory power. This is all section eight, number eight of Dominici Chain. This is key because this propitiatory power is cited as the basis for all further teaching on the holiness of sacred orders, the role of the priest, the, the, the holiness of the church, all of these things. And propitiatory power is understood as restitution or rebuilding, restoring what has been lost by sin. That is what the love of Christ on the cross accomplishes, a restoring what has been lost by sin. And what has been lost by sin is relationship to the Father, uh, is the life of grace, uh, is the promise of heaven. And, and Pope John Paul II is using that language of restitution and restoring deliberately because there's a, there's a, a, a hearkening back, even in that word restoring, a glimmer, if you will, of the other great Pope uh, of, of the 20th century, Pope St. Pius X, uh, who is you know, often called the Pope of Holy Communion, Pope of the Eucharist. And his motto was to restore all things in Christ. So that love and the, 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 the or propitiatory power of the sacrifice of Christ is at the center of the mystery of the Eucharist. And that love, that sacrifice of the cross, is one and the same as the sacrifice of the Mass. It, the Mass represents that sacrifice. The Eucharist is above all a sacrifice. Dominici Cheney number nine, a direct quote of Trent. And then it is an unambiguous then unfolding of the doctrinal content of the Council of Trent, uh, which sought to define and defend Eucharistic theology and doctrine against the, uh, you know, the various aberrations of Protestantism. The cross is represented, it is made present, and therefore the fruits of that sacrifice is applied in the celebration of the Mass. This is actually Domenice Cheney's way of talking about Eucharistic communion, what we would say more readily today, there, it's still the language of the fruits of the Mass, the fruits of the Eucharistic sacrifice. This, again, in the central chapters, number eight and number nine, is almost exclusively how the cross is presented and how the sacrifice of the Mass is, is, is spiritually efficacious for the faithful. There are those who say that, you know, the theology of sacrifice there uh, by whom and for this is, is left stated. Uh, and actually, um, it focuses simply on Christ as the actor. Christ as the one giving himself on the cross, which therefore translates then into a focus on the priest standing in persona Christi Capitis, in the person of Christ the head, who is acting, the actor in the sacrifice. There is, uh, there's a um, I think an observation to be made here, if you will just allow me a brief tangent on theology in the 1980s, particularly sacramental theology in the 1980s, uh, you know, led by, in, at least in the English speaking world, uh, Father Edward Kilmartin, uh, who was the director of, the, of the, um, uh, the chair of the Department of Theology and Liturgy at the University of Notre Dame for a long time that there was this, this kind of theological attempt to reconcile um, uh, Catholic theological uh, reflection on the Eucharist with Protestant theological reflection on the Eucharist and see if there couldn't be, you know, produced in that, in that exchange, in that theological exchange, uh, a unifying theology of the Eucharist. And so, you know, a, a number of theologians um, writing and working in the 1980s found to Minister Cheney to be a little bit unhelpful to that regard because it's so clearly focused on the, uh, on the doctrinal formulation of Trent. But all of this, so the love of Christ is uh, having that power to restore and forgive sins 
is really present in the Eucharist because the cross itself, the cross itself is uh, at the heart of the Eucharistic sacrifice and therefore the church and therefore the church. So the Second Vatican Council talks about the church, defines it as a people brought into unity by the unity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's Lumen Gentium number four. And so John Paul II obviously desires to show continuity with that. So the, in the logic of this letter, mass is a sacramental encounter with the cross. The Eucharist draws all together those persons who are having that encounter. And the, the, and the prototype of persons each encountering Christ is the fellowship of the apostles with Christ at the Last Supper. Let me read you briefly uh, an example of, of what I mean of how Dominice Cene talks about the communion uh, with Christ leading towards, leading to communion with one another. This is number four, Dominice Cene number four. In Eucharistic communion, we receive Christ, Christ himself, and our union with him, which is a gift and a grace for each individual, brings about that in Christ, we are also associated in the unity of the body, which is the church, with one another. Only in this way, rather key phrase, only in this way, through that faith and that disposition of mind, is there brought about the building up of the church, which in the Eucharist finds its source and summit, according to the well-known expression of the Second Vatican Council. So you see what happens there? In Eucharistic communion, we receive Christ, and our union with him, which is individual, brings it about that we are associated with one another. That is hierarchical communion, is the concept of hierarchical communion. So if you remember the way that you were taught of the church as an institution, the church as communion, you know, you were taught the pyramid thing and the Pope on the top and all the different layers, uh, you know, the, the cardinals, the bishops, you know, the priests, the deacons, the religious sisters, everybody else was the bottom of the pyramid. That actually was, is, a, is not a very good image at all for, for the way that the church has always understood communion. It's a dandelion. Think of a dandelion. You've got the stem and you've got the bulby thing in the center. And then all of the little things that used to blow off, you know, and see them go all over the place are all attached to the center. And to the sense that they're attached to the center, their fronds are attached to each other. That's the image of hierarchical communion that, 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 that Dominice Cheney certainly underscores. Our union with Christ leads to communion with one another. So the point of all of that, I mean, this is a hugely brief and broad stroked view of, of this apostolic letter, but the point is this, that there is a sustained focus on Christ's sacrificial action on the cross, which is represented in the mass. And that objective presence of Christ bears fruit in me, the forgiveness of sins, because of my relationship with Christ in that moment, which in turn leads to the communion of the church. What is the Pope doing? here, but demonstrating a complete continuity of doctrinal formulation from Trent to Vatican II to the present moment, 1980. It's as if, you know, and, and, and uh, astute commentators picked this up at the time, um, because this is even before the split with the Lefebvreists and everything like this, uh, as if Domenice Cheney is, seeing, is saying to the church, see, look, Vatican II did not alter our Eucharistic faith. Lots of things changed in your experience, but the core remains, the doctrine remains, what we believe about the Eucharist remains, that these liturgical reforms did not mean rupture, but were intended to elucidate this doctrine and not create a new one. So there is the pastoral, if you will, approach to the thing, 1980. And then, as I say, not a whole lot in terms of theological or doctrinal work on the Eucharist until 2003, where, and again, he publishes an encyclical on the Eucharist on Holy Thursday. And on Holy Thursday, 2003, the Pope is celebrating now his 25th anniversary uh, of his Petrine ministry. 
So therefore, this document is exceptionally easy reading because it's so personal. Uh, he's got this great depth of emotion and personal feeling as he's recounting all sorts of celebrations of the mass all over the world. And it's and it's funny because, you know, I mean, uh, in, in the life of the church, 23 years is kind of a blink of the eye. So he, um, he does say rather directly that uh, 23 years later, he desires uh, to take up anew the thread that he began in Dominice Cheney. So he explicitly says that Ecclesia of the Eucharistia is a continuing of the reflection from 1980, Dominice Cheney. So if Dominice Cheney is thoroughly Christological, focused on the person and action of Christ, Ecclesia de Eucharistia is thoroughly Trinitarian. If the concern of the first document is to reach out to Tridentine Catholics, call them that, uh, in the immediate aftermath of the Second Vatican Council, the encyclical of 2003 follows the great jubilee of 2000 and if you will charts a path it's meant to be a roadmap for the new evangelization in the third millennium and so we can take the same three themes the sacrifice of jesus on the cross its representation in the eucharist and what that means for the church and just look at them from the perspective of the encyclical to see how things have uh, are expressed perhaps a little bit differently so the self-offering of Jesus on the cross, that was, was chapters in Domenice Cheney, only receives a very, very brief mention in Ecclesia de Eucharistia. And the brief mention is basically to quote Domenice Cheney. In other words, there it is. But now sacrifice, now sacrifice is framed differently. It's framed in the context of relational language, the language of the Trinity. That sacrifice is the free gift of love to the Father. It is a response in, by the Son for all that the Son receives from the Father. And so the Pope can write, Sacrifice, the gift of love and obedience to the point of giving his life in the first place, is a gift to his Father. Certainly it's a gift given for our sake, and then indeed for all of humanity. Yet it is first and foremost a gift to the Father. He says it again in number 13. So whereas Domenice Cheney said it's a sacrifice that frees us from sin, period. This is the, the, the language of gift. That yes, of course it has this effect of freeing us from sin. Uh, it's for our sake. But first and foremost, it is a return of love to the Father. The Father responds to this gift by sending his life-giving spirit. So sacrifice is not something that befalls Jesus, something that happens to him by happenstance. He remains the actor, but in a much more relational sense. And so the description of what he's doing in giving himself over in this way is going to take on all sorts of uh, relational terminology that you'll find throughout the encyclical. Generosity, freedom, gratuity, and universality all of which become very key themes for John Paul II's doctrine. We saw that in Dominice Cheney, the representation of the sacrifice of the cross in the mass was an extremely important uh, uh, feature. It is something that was, was definitely accented. And yes, Ecclesia de Eucharistia, in a few brief sentences, repeats the doctrinal formulations of Dominice Cheney because that in a word, in, in a certain sense, sends the boundaries. But then once the boundaries are set, the encyclical goes into a different direction, or I'll, I would at least say a different focus. Representation of Christ's sacrifice in the mass is fully realized, not only in its efficacy, the forgiveness of sins, but in communion, that Christ's objective and his objective presence is not an end in itself, you know, just, you know, to arrive at a forgiveness of sins, but it is <clears throat> directed towards drawing us into the communion of the Blessed Trinity, which is the life of grace that the forgiveness of sins implies. You know, the point of having your sins forgiven is so that you can enter into the joy of the Father's love. I mean, there's a line from the encyclical. So if you look at number 16 uh, of the encyclical, this is the point. Communion, sharing the life of the Blessed Trinity. That's the point. And through then, therefore, the instrumentality of the priest, 
who has been anointed by the Holy Spirit. The Eucharist makes present the redeeming sacrifice of, of the cross. Yes. And it is the Holy Spirit that works for the full realization and efficacy of that Christological core of the sacrament. Indeed, all throughout the encyclical, but particularly in number 17 and number 23, you see that there is a real, again, laser focus on saying that the work of the Word and the Spirit, the Son and the Spirit, are inseparable. That what the Spirit is doing is making the mission and person of the Son present, the sacrifice of the Son present. And our sanctification, therefore, is the work of the Spirit. As the Spirit is called down on the Eucharistic elements at Mass, it's also called down on the gathered community of the faithful. And so that the common work of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the one who is the initiator of love, the one who returns love and self-giving sacrifice, self-emptying sacrifice, the Spirit is the overflowing of the Father's love for the Son and the Son's love for the Father, which takes that, that which is accomplished in the son's sacrifice and actualizes it in the life of the believer, drawing the believer into the new life and new communion of the father that is the direct result of the son's life-giving sacrifice of the new covenant. Okay, the point that the encyclical keeps making again and again and again is the work of our salvation is the work of God, the triune God, the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit. And coming to know that is that what drives then the missionary impulse of the church, drawn to the Father in the Son and enlivened by the Holy Spirit. And therefore, now the church. The ecclesiology here is Trinitarian. It's not simply that hierarchical communion that I'm in relationship with Christ and so therefore I'm in relationship with you, but but a much more Trinitarian sense, just to give you a, a flavor. Um, here's a quote from number 34 of the encyclical. The church is called during her earthly pilgrimage to maintain and promote communion with the triune God and communion among the faithful. For this purpose, she possesses the word and the sacraments, particularly the Eucharist, by which she constantly lives and grows and in which she expresses her very nature. It is not by chance that the term communion has become one of the names given to this sublime sacrament. The Eucharist thus appears as the culmination of all the sacraments in perfecting our communion with God the Father by identification with his only begotten Son through the working of the Holy Spirit. Again, that's number 34. You see it there. Communion and the Eucharist are so inseparable that, again, most people call receiving communion or receiving the Eucharist, receiving Holy Communion. You know, that, that, that these two things are so completely uh, and intimate rela related that they are, in fact, interchangeable terms. So there you have it. You have this kind of progression through the way that the Holy Father, John Paul II, is developing Eucharistic doctrine. It's not a development of doctrine, since it's the same fundamental doctrine. I mean, the one document quotes the other document um, that's being expressed and developed there. What is notably different is the different emphases, the different style, and the attentiveness to the moment, to the pastoral needs of the church. What did the church in 1980 need to hear? Experiencing the aftermath of the Second Vatican Council as a fresh experience. What did the church in 2003 need to hear? All right, we celebrated this great jubilee. Now what? What do we do going forward? How do we take this thing, this life in Christ that we've celebrated and move it forward into and, and translate that into a way of living and witnessing the gospel uh, in the third Christian millennium? There is a definite movement, you know, theologically speaking, from a Christological to a Trinitarian presentation of doctrine. You know, the focus has definitely shifted. Uh, and, and I would say that this is perhaps prepared um, and maybe even because of, I don't know, uh, that would be, <laughs> someone can write a doctorate on this, whether or not the Catechism of the Catholic Church in 1992 is the bridge document here uh, between these two things. Because by the Catechism, if you read the section on the Eucharist in the Catechism, 
it is thoroughly trinitarian. It is thoroughly trinitarian. So that when you read Ecclesia de Eucharistia, it's going to sound like what the catechism says and less like what Dominici Cene says. So that might be a thing. Um, if 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 Dominici Cene is responding to uh, how to articulate continuity in the midst of upheaval, therefore Ecclesia de Eucharistia responds to a more contemporary theological challenge. You know the the uh, the splitting the splitting of the mission of the Son and the Spirit, which was extremely in vogue in the 19, late 1980s, 1990s, and early 2000s. If you look at the contemporary theological, pick up any you know couple of issues of theological studies in those times, this is what you see, a, pure, a personal and proper role of the Holy Spirit. You know, lots of theologians arguing for that. Why? Well, because honestly, that's how you get to certain things that you want to accomplish, like the ordination of women, or even lay presidency at the Eucharist or other such things. And, you know, and Ecclesia de Eucharistia coming back and insisting that on the old, if you will, scholastic axiom that all action of the Trinity outside of itself is one. There is no splitting the mission of the Spirit and the mission of the Son. The marriage mission of the Spirit actualizes the mission of the Son. And it must simply be said that on John Paul II, on his own theological reflection and his own theological thought, there is a tremendous influence that flows from the so-called communio theologians, Ratzinger, von Balthasar, de Lubac, um, uh, Danilu, Grillmeyer, you know, all of those folks and all of the work that they were doing. And they were very kind of Trinitarian uh, focused. The point of all of this is that the church's faith is very rich and tradition and its expression is not static. It is not monolithic. It is not ignorant of the pastoral situation of the church. You cannot just memorize one formulation and have that be uh, enough. John Paul II is constantly working to give a fresh formulation to an ancient faith. And that which is spoken is therefore an enduring truth. You're giving, you're giving truth the ability to resound, not, no, not simply as an intellectual exercise, but as a, a very personal thing that well, changes hearts and changes minds and draws people into a real relationship with the risen Lord. How it is spoken, how truth is spoken, well, that requires both the pastor's heart and the theologian's head. And in the person of John Paul II, a great figure of the theological tradition, we have a very prime example of just that kind of thing the one who speaks the truth from the heart, drawing on the full wisdom of the church's tradition. So that's kind of my presentation there. Um, I mean, as I say, I didn't do much justice to the two documents other than to kind of lay them side by side. But, you know, take that up as an interesting exercise, if you will, particularly in this month of the Sacred Heart and whatever. Read Dominite Cheney and read, you know, the 2003 Ecclesia de Eucharistia. Same faith. But wow, what very different presentations. Bishop Lopes, thank you so much. That was a, a fantastic uh, overview, Re really fruitful talk. And uh, you mentioned the, the month of the Sacred Heart. It couldn't be more timely. You know, I was before we have a few questions. And so before I get to those, I, I wanted to say, you know, it's interesting in, in our Vatican II class, we go when we go through Sacrosanctum Concilium, we, we do mm. precisely that. We actually end up with these documents and it's interesting because we'll, you know, read some, some, some stuff from the church father, some quotes, you know, and then trace it through to Trent and then on. And it's, it's the, the continuity is really striking. And especially mm -hmm. where he starts talking, you know, he talks about, you know, kind of the primacy of sacrifice in the Eucharist and meal is important, but it's primarily a sacrifice. And that's something Benedict picks up. So is that, is that sure. something that you take as important? Oh, yes, absolutely. You know, I mean, um, there, there's, there's, there's so much, you know, that, and, and Benedict's own project is a little bit different. You know, I'm thinking of Sacramentum Caritatis and uh, some of the stuff that he was working on. Um, but there it's, it's, he's kind of dealing with it from a, a, a postmodern thing where even the idea of meal breaks down, you know, but to come back to the authenticity of sacrifice uh, and, and the fact that, the, uh, that it's freely chosen and it is responsive to someone um, become, if you will, the hallmarks, the benchmarks 
uh, for both Benedict and, and John Paul II, certainly. I love I love that Bishop and it, it may as you were talking I was thinking about uh, when you were talking about uh, Benedict's particular emphasis even spirit of the liturgy in the beginning where he does that fantastic liturgical exegesis of of the Exodus and this whole notion of revelation as, as right. received rather than created and um, yeah I mean right I mean, right right liturgy is the locus of revelation I mean you know and he he has that whole marvelous thing of uh, which doesn't work, doesn't so much work in English, but in German, you know, Wort and Antwort, you know, the word that is spoken and its response, you know, uh, as, it, it, and how that plays out in, in the Trinitarian relationship and therefore what that reveals about uh, our own relationship with God. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. So, uh, Bishop, a few questions now. Um, First of all, what other things do you suggest that lay people read, maybe lay people without a proper theological formation? I mean, how do they they do this if they want to go deeper besides reading? You know, the, the, mentioned. right, you know, because you read documents and even to read academic theology is just so blastedly boring sometimes, you know. Um, one of the books I just finished, I just finished about a, a week and a half ago, um, Professor David Fagerberg from Notre Dame has a new book out called Liturgical Dogmatics. It's fantastic, uh, I think, in that he, he's, and he says it in his preface that he deliberately tried to unjargon it. Uh, and so each chapter is like three and a half pages long, exactly. And it just kind of goes through all of the tenets of the faith and how these are taken up and expressed liturgically. Uh, and so he's building a synthesis, he's building a mosaic by simply describing, if you will, the mosaic that is the celebration of mass uh, and how that all of the faith is kind of expressed and contained uh, in those rhythms and those rituals and those colors and those facets. So liturgical dogmatics is um, a very good one. And I would go back to Romano Guardini's Spirit of Liturgy, uh, certainly. And my favorite um, uh, is, is always still going to be Father Jean Carbon, Wellspring of Worship. Uh, Father Carbon, you know, is, is not a well-known author, I would say. Uh, Ignatius Press has done some great work kind of recovering and publishing his stuff. Uh, but everybody knows his writing because he is the direct author of part four of the Catechism on Prayer, uh, the Prayer and Spirituality section of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Uh, and so was a good, a close collaborator, both of John Paul II and Cardinal Ratzinger. Fantastic. This is, we have two questions and I'm going to kind of roll into one. Um, you, you mentioned it, very interestingly, you know, the, the kind of the, the zeitgeist of the 80s and then you being kind of this, this ecumenism, maybe an exaggerated ecumenism. And then you also mentioned uh, the, 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 the Holy Spirit craze that was, came around. So th this question is kind of, uh, what is kind of the state of, the situation now and the other question that dovetails into this is bishop loves thank you for a wonderful presentation what do these two documents have to say to the current situation in the u.s so kind of a status questionis <laughs> sure uh well <laughs> there's nothing implied there at all i'm sure no. um, we can yeah <laughs> yeah uh, look you know i mean you, if you're going to apply something, you know, I'll take the second part of that thing first. If you're going to apply something uh, to to the current you know situation, and right now, you know, the, the whole press thing is about politicians and this, that, and the other thing. Um, I would come at it this way: Why would you? If I'm a if I'm a Catholic in public life, or and I just don't mean a politician. I mean a doctor. I mean a lawyer. I mean a business this person i mean you know there are all sorts of public lives out there you know um, but you know and then there's also people who partic participate in government why would you you know what is the what is the desire what is the intention what is the understanding of who and what you're receiving in the eucharist um, you know and and you know to understand that 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 this is an act done that is a personal relationship but also that you know that as you saw in both Dominici Cene and Ecclesia de Eucharistia there is no abstracting it from the church that this is not me and my Jesus right that that there is that the reception of the Eucharist implies things about 
membership in the church, about participation of the body in the body of Christ, or I think it was the language of Domenici Cheney, the building up of the body of Christ. Well, that can only be done in truth. That can only be done in virtue. Um, and, you know, now you're back to the Justin Martyr and the Ignatians of Antioch stuff about, you know, eating and drinking condemnation and things like this, if you're, if, you know, and the worthy reception of the sacrament. Is what you're doing in the reception of the sacrament uh, consistent with the life that you are leading? And I think that is not just an abstracted question that can be only applied to certain individuals, but that is, if you will, the moral implication every single time any one of us goes to Mass and receives Holy Communion. You know, am I living a life of Eucharistic consistency? That was, um, that was Benedict XVI's phrase in Sacramentum Caritatis. You know, and it was meant there as a general, if you will, examination of conscience for everyone. As to you know how these two things you know continue you know these these theological uh, uh, where are we now with with the Eucharist? Well, you know it, we're kind of in a very interesting place. I worry um, about two things. I worry about that you know oh, oh, the over technologicalization of our kids and our young people. You know, I'm, you, you meet more and more kids who do not know how to have a relationship. If you don't know how to have a relationship, how to give yourself in relationship appropriately uh, on a human level, how in the world are we going to do it on a supernatural level? Um, and and to, so the understanding of, of the real presence of Christ is being drawn into a relationship with the Father in the Son. I mean, these are very personal and personalistic terms. Is there too much of a technological abstraction that we're no longer able to relate, that we think having a friend on Facebook and having a real human being in our life is kind of the same thing. It is not. You know, a curated life on um, Instagram and the life you actually lead are the same thing. Well, no, it is not. You know, so that there's all sorts of epistemological and, and sociological implications uh, to our, our current moment that have real implications uh, on our Eucharistic faith, because, you know, I don't know how well we're doing at, at teaching our young people to really kind of be drawn into relationships that form and change them. And that's a thing. And then, of course, there's the whole pandemic thing uh, and what we've done by putting Mass just on TV uh, again, um, you know, and the whole kind of the virtual Mass thing, uh, which, is, which is a problem, which is a real problem. You know, and now trying to invite people back to the reality of the sacrament um, is proving challenging and it's challenging for pastors uh, and, and faithful alike. And I think that's something that the church needs to give a lot more attention to. That's, um, I, that's very interesting, especially the comment about even social media that you mentioned, the curated Instagram, where there's kind of this alto, you know, this kind of uh, pseudo reality. And again, I'm thinking of, of Benedict you know, where he, for Benedict, of course, as you know, it, it, the, the, the liturgy is, uh, it, there's kind of an anthropological need for correct liturgy, whereby, you know, liturgy orients, uh, you know, our sense of truth and beauty and law, even and ethics. Um, yep. Well, I, I would put it this way, in a, in a Benedictine sense, you know, Benedict XVI, liturgy is the most real thing you do. You know, and actually, that's what Sanctum Concilium says. That's what Source and Summit actually means. Liturgy is the most real thing you do, and everything else that you do flows from it, positively or negatively. Yeah, that's fascinating. Well, this is the next question then kind of draws on that. So for um, in the context of busy working parents who don't have time to read a lot of theology, but they're faithfully in the pews every Sunday, how do they, you know, kind of maximize or get the most out of their, their Sunday Eucharist? in the context of, you know, the busy ups and downs and the ebbs and flows of, of uh, lay life? The two easiest and most important things are, you know, if, you, if you've got the, you know, Magnificat or whatever, one of these services that gives you the Sunday readings, read the Sunday readings before you go to Mass. Do not let Mass be the first time you hear the Sunday readings. If that's all you do, I promise you it will change the way you go to Mass. Because, you know, it, it allows your brain and then it allows your heart 
to mulch over them a little bit uh, before, you know, you're kind of led through the homily or whatever to a real uh, kind of encounter with the readings. Because, again, we're talking about presence of Christ in the Eucharist, but Christ is certainly present in his word. So that's a, that's a hugely important thing. And one, frankly, that doesn't take a whole lot of time. The, secondly, the second thing is, again, church documents are not brief. Uh, and, and they're not necessarily known for their, their <laughs> uh, prosaic style, you know, where you can, but the catechism is. The catechism is paragraphs, not pages. And most of us, you know, when we went out and bought them in the 90s, because this was a, this is a new thing, you know, first catechism in over 500 years, this is not bad. You know, they sit happily now on our bookshelves. Well, open it up. I find, I had to give a talk the other day on the real presence. And it's fascinating, you know, the catechism is really well done. You have a paragraph of the doctrine, and then the next paragraph are simply two quotes from the fathers, you know, explaining the doctrine. You know, and they're from homilies. So it's the way that the doctrine has been preached liturgically that's given there. It, you know, and you can, in the space of less than five minutes, you know, go through a couple of things. And so there's, there's a real intellectual feeding of faith, too. And you're being exposed not to some dry, formulaic expression. But as I say, most of that thing is quotes from homilies, from pastoral reflections, from letters of the saints. Um, the greatest is John, uh, Joan of Arc on the Eucharist. Uh, on the Eucharist, and the, uh, the, the, the church and the body of Christ uh, are the same thing. You know, you, that can be a pretty complicated theological thing. And it quotes this thing from Joan of Arc's trial. About Christ and the church, I would say, well, they're the same thing, and it's no use complicating the matter beyond that, period. <laughs> you know, I mean, great stuff like that is, is in the catechism, too. So that's an easy thing. Uh, so do you have time for one more question? Sure. Uh, so I, I got this question twice, actually. So it clearly uh, it needs to be asked then. Both, both two people uh, wrote in. Um, basically, there's this Pew study that we all know about 25 or 30 yeah. percent of Catholics believe in the real presence of the Eucharist. So one person said, well, how did we get here? Uh, and and the and another person said, well, and then given this Pew study, well, what do we do? And And these are obviously we're talking about now people that. First, you know, there was the question about what do what do engaged lay people read, and then there was the question about well, what do engaged lay people that don't read do? And now <laughs> the question mm -hmm. is like, well, what about you know uh, lay people who don't even go to mass, maybe, or don't even know the doctrine? What do we do, and how did we get here? And you know, what's the the uh, right? Yeah. I I I would say as a general principle, as a general rule, I hate polls uh, because you never quite know, you know, what they're asking. You certainly don't know who they're asking. You know, I mean, the thing with a, even that Pew study is like of Catholics. Well, they didn't ask me and they didn't ask any of the people that I encounter with on Sunday. So, I mean, who are they asking? Are they asking people who are going to mass every Sunday? Because I would imagine if you are, you're going to get a very, very different answer than the person who is only tangentially or only culturally Catholic. Oh, yeah, I'm a Catholic. Well, do you believe that that's Jesus? Uh, no. I mean, how could it be so little, you know? Because the person hasn't been to mass since their great grandmother's funeral or some such thing, you know. So, I don't know how valuable, you know, the, the that that information is. I really do think the bigger damaging thing has been the pandemic shutdown, and the the way that we have made, you know, it so accessible to 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 attend mass virtually. You know, that's a problem because, again, it is an extremely sacramental and therefore personal act. You cannot watch it on TV without the engagements of sight and smell and taste and touch and, and sound and the whole and even the body. You know, the, the old Catholic calisthenics thing. of Now we stand. Now we kneel. Now we do this. You know, that there's a there's a sense to which the whole of our person is not being engaged in that. And so what does mass become? An intellectual abstraction. And then the silly way that we dealt with um, obligation, you know, we're just going to dispense everybody from obligation. Well, what does that mean? You know, because there's an obligation that arises in our lives, you know, because of things. You have to pay your taxes, you have to drive the speed limit, you know, you have to pay for your groceries after you put them in your cart, you know, all these things, these are obligations. Now, that is an entirely different thing 
than the obligation of a husband to his wife or a wife to her husband, or the obligation of a parent to child uh, or a child to parent. You know, the obligations of persons and the fact that the Eucharist is a real encounter, a personal encounter. You know, just as we would not say FaceTiming with grandma during the pandemic was the same thing as being with grandma, so too with, with, with this, the obligation that, that that relationship has. Christ is in our midst. God is in our midst. You know, how are we going to respond? Um, and it was not a great thing for the church to say, well, let's just not worry about that right now. And that, very subtle, but something shifted, something I would even say broke in the minds of a lot of Catholics about how they even view the Mass and why you should go every Sunday. You know, is it really just another form of obligation like the speed limit, or is this something else? Is this something else that arises out of a real relationship? That's interesting. Yeah, it'll be. I was uh, interviewing a, an applicant for the MA program who was working as a DRE. I think he's a, I think he was a DRE at a local parish, and he was saying, um, you know, and I haven't seen any numbers yet on what the, you know what it looks like coming back. But he was saying at their parish, they're just having people tr real trouble just getting people to come back. I mean, they're way down. And right. uh, I mean, is that your right. you know is that what you're here? Obviously, you're it's you know much more connected. Is that what you're hearing? Uh, it's not what I'm experiencing. The ordinary is a very little bit of a different little patch in Catholic land. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, uh, our people are back. I just want to say that. I'll just say it that way. Our people are back and they brought friends. Yeah. Uh, but in a lot of other places, I'm hearing it's as much as 40%. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That they're, they, you know, yeah. yeah. That, that they're, they're, there are a number of places that are down 40%. Wow. Still. Wow. That's um, we someone someone uh, sent a comment in on your the comment on on preparing for Eucharist for busy families. Um, Bill, B Bishop Fulton Sheen said the same thing. Mass begins in the home um, as you you know get the family. He says dressing the little ones ready to come to mass begins with the readings. Um, you know, tell the stories, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. Well, let me, I'll say that. I mean, there, here's, here's a soapbox moment. Let me stand on it. Dress up for church. Dress up for church, you know, and dress your kids up for church because nothing, uh, nothing informs, nothing forms a child in the understanding of what I'm about to do more than what I'm wearing to do it, you know, and that we change clothes. You do not wear your, your clothes to your school to go jump in the swimming pool, you, you know, that there are different clothes for different things and, 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 and dressing up you know, is only for special occasions. It's, it's extremely powerful, the effect that that has. Bishop, it's really been a pleasure. You've given us a lot of food for thought, and this is, we'll be promoting this on social media throughout the month of uh, the Sacred Heart. And so, uh, you know, you've given us some, some, we have some homework, some documents to read, and uh, as you know, they, they are fantastic documents. You've given us a good overview. I'm going to actually include this when we go over these documents in the, when we cover Sacrosanct of Concilium. It's a, it's a very helpful overview, especially in the modern context. So thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. We really appreciate it. And, uh, we, uh, and uh, yeah, we wish you all the best. And we hope maybe you can come back and join us next year. Sounds good to me. Thank you. God bless. Thank you very much, Bishop. We'll talk to you soon.